Okay, we're glad to have you in our service here today and being the uh, first Sunday in December here and uh, uh, moving toward uh, Christmas on the 25th, which happens to come on Sunday this year, then we're going to bring a Christmas message here. So we're going to examine that and see what the Lord has uh, uh, done. You know, when you're singing like that, praise the Lord that your husband loves your singing too. There was a fellow name of Joe, Joe's wife, she loved to sing, and she decided to join the church choir, which was good. And then from time to time she had practiced uh, in the kitchen when she was preparing dinner, she would practice, you know, singing because she just loved to sing. But whenever she would start a song, her husband Joe, he would head outside to the porch. And this really upset his wife, and she said, uh, hurt her feelings, and she said, what's the matter, Joe? Don't you like my singing? And her husband said, he said, uh, yes, honey, I just love your singing. I just wanted to make sure the neighbors didn't know I was beating you. <laughs> well, that's, uh, everybody has problems, I guess, don't they, huh? Okay. Well, to start here this morning, the thing that we want to do here, there are a lot of people that say, well, you know, if you put a Christmas tree in your church, well, then you're quite a sinner, and uh, you're worshiping heathens, and... Uh, you're worshiping a heathen god and so forth like that and they always go to the book of Jeremiah chapter 10 so I'd like for you to go over there if you will and uh, I had a man and this was the same man I told you about earlier here here a few years ago he came down to the house and uh, he sat down at the kitchen table there and turned to Jeremiah chapter 10 and uh, he said do you see here they cut the tree out of there and they worship the tree and so forth like that and I sat and explained it to him, went down through the verses there. I'd like to read here verses 2 to 4, okay, so that you understand this. This was cutting a tree out of the woods, using the stalk and carving it for one of their idols. They would deck it with gold and silver because these idols were precious to them. These were their false god. It was an idol of a false god. Then they would put clothing on them and so forth. So, let's look at verses 2 to 4. Thus saith the Lord, Learn not the way of the heathen, and be not dismayed at the signs of heaven. For the heathen are dismayed at them, for the customs of the people are vain. For one cutteth a tree out of the forest, the work of the hands of the workmen with an axe. They deck it with silver and gold, and fasten, then fasten it with nails, and with hammers, that it move not. They are upright as the palm tree, but speak not. They must needs be born, because they cannot go. Be not afraid of them, for they cannot do evil, neither also is it in them to do, to, uh, do good. Notice in verse 8 and 9. <clears throat> we come on down. But they are altogether brutish and foolish. The stock is a doctrine of vanities. Silver spread on the plates is brought before Tarshish, and the gold from Euphos, and the work of the workmen, and of the hands of the founder, blue and purple is their clothing. They are all the work of cutting men. Their clothing is not put on a Christmas tree. The clothing is put on an idol that they make of their false god, and so forth there. Look in verse 14. Every man is brutish in his knowledge. Every founder is confounded by the graven image for his molten image is falsehood, and there is no breath in them. Talking about worshiping a false god, and so forth. Another thing, between 6 and 700, Jeremiah wrote this, and there was no Christmas because Christ had not come yet. This is talking about their false gods and their false idols. It has nothing to do with a Christmas tree whatsoever. But... If any of you put any of your gold and silver on this tree here, if you have some, go ahead and put it on. I'll take the tree down when we're finished here. I don't want to burden you. And uh, But, no, it is not. But we see the evergreen. You see an evergreen. And it would represent eternal life because it never wilts away. It never fades away or anything else. It stays green all through the winter and all through the season, does it not? Sure. With a star on top. And uh, I think that uh, uh, the star would represent the Lord Jesus. Of course. And the lights and so forth there, he is the light of the world. And the gifts that we give and so forth. Is there anything wrong with giving a gift? You give it on a birthday, don't you? Don't you give gifts to your relatives on a birthday or your sons or so forth? 
what's wrong if you want to exchange a gift in commemoration of the great gift that God gave us when he came from heaven to earth to die upon the cross? All of this is your super people who will take away, and I just want to say this, it is true. Originally, Christmas was transferred from a pagan holiday into worshiping on and commemorating the birth of the Lord Jesus Christ. But we didn't bring in all of the things that were from the pagan. We don't worship pagan idols. Fine. I thank the Lord that we have a day that we can recognize. And because you'll get people that will come to church on a Christmas or an Easter that ordinarily would not come to church. Another thing, too, that if you take these away from a child who does not understand or anything else, you don't bring your child to church to worship the tree. I've never seen anybody get down and bow before the tree and so forth there, unless they were trying to steal a package or something and slip it in their coat. But I've never, I'm just kidding. But I've never seen anything like that at all. And if you have children, I'm going to say this to Christians, and you want to take away Christmas from them, when this celebrates the birth of the Lord Jesus Christ, it emphasizes that part of his life because without his birth there would be no cross. Without the cross there would be no resurrection. So therefore, you take that away when other kids are celebrating Christmas and have gifts exchanged and so forth, you're going to turn your child off to where uh, they, they'll never want anything to do with church again because you have robbed them of something they enjoy, you know. And uh, I'll never forget for Easter one time, I, uh, my uh, grandmother, uh, she wanted me to come over while she was coloring eggs. And when I went out to the kitchen there, Mom dropped me off, and uh, she said, uh, we're coloring these Easter eggs. And I said, we have to do that, the bunny lays them. That was just real small. And I still thought the bunny laid the Easter eggs, you know. And uh, I'm just a little chat. But I'll never forget that, because she blew my whole thing by coloring eggs, you know, because she was chipping the bunny out of the out of the <laughs> thing that he's supposed to be doing, you know, and she's taking over his job. This is how kids think, see, and they do that. Thank the Lord you're not like that. Thank the Lord you're not so spiritual that you think you're doing something evil or you're doing something satanic because we have a Christmas tree to celebrate the birth of the Lord Jesus Christ. If they want to do it, do it. And uh, I'm glad he related three pages here of everything out of the Old Testament why you're a sinner now if you exchange gifts at Christmas time. So I thought I'd bring that out to you, but this is where they always go is Jeremiah chapter 10, okay? Now, if you have your, uh, we'd like to bring this out here too if we can. And it goes in with, uh, get your paper if you have that, what we gave out to you on your outline here on uh, Genesis chapter 49 verse here, uh, 49 and verse 10 goes in verses 8 to 12, but in verse 10, The Sepulchre shall not depart from Judah, nor a lawgiver from between his feet, until Shiloh come. Now, we're going back to that, and with this, let me just point this out, as we've done many, many times. Why do we have Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John? We find out that Matthew, Mark, and Luke are sometimes referred to as the Synoptic Gospels, as they all agree. Well, they don't all agree, there is no differentiation, but one will give added information that the other did not give. They're a composite of the four-sided picture of the Lord Jesus Christ. John will list some things when the, that happened that Luke didn't put in. And the reason of that is, you'll have those say, well, Matthew copied from Luke, and, and Luke copied from John, and John copied from Mark. So therefore, it wasn't divine inspiration, God says that all Scripture is given by the inspiration of God and is profitable for reproof, correction, instruction, and righteousness, and so forth. Prophecy came not in the old time by the will of man, but holy men spake as they were moved by the Holy Spirit of God. So, you never find a contradiction between Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, although one may add a few things. Now, I remember, and uh, uh, this is one of the things that uh, has convicted people, is a so-called eyewitness to a crime. I uh, am not much for eyewitness. I'm so glad they have this forensic evidence now with the DNA and so forth because eyewitnesses are sometimes the most unreliable that you can get. 
because they're seeing something the, a far away that they assume will <coughs> have the same kind of coat on or the same color as somebody that they know or something like that. And there's been quite a few people convicted on an eyewitness, been in jail for years, and <laughs> just was not the person, and so forth. I remember a lady that drove up, I was sitting desk uh, one night on the police department, this lady drove up and uh, tooting the horn and everything else, and uh, I went out, she didn't get out of the car, so I went out of the office, out of the car, said, said, well, what's the matter? She said, I've been shot. And she had. <laughs> she had been shot in the stomach there with a 22. And uh, so anyway, we called an ambulance right away, and uh, it had just happened just a short time before. And, uh, but she drove to headquarters. And, uh, but anyway, after questioning her, after in, in the hospital and so forth like that, I said, well, can you describe the gun? Yes, it was a big, it, it, it had to be a 357 Magnum. Well, it was a 22. And thank the Lord it was a 22. It didn't hit any vital organs or that to where it couldn't be fixed, you know, and so forth there. I've had other things where people will describe something and come to find out that, that they weren't even in the ballpark. And uh, so I don't put much credibility into an eyewitness after you've experienced some things. You've been on the police department quite a while and you've experienced some things with these so-called eyewitnesses and turn out not to be. Uh, now there are times eyewitnesses are right, but not all of the time. A lot of circumstances depend upon that. Whether the person's moving, whether they have the back to them, whether they're seeing the side of them. Uh, now, of course, if they're standing right in front of them and shoot them, I would put my credibility into the eyewitness, wouldn't you? Yeah, I would too, but they're, they're, they're not all like that. So, but anyway, Matthew presents the Lord Jesus Christ. Each one has their emphasis up on the four-sided picture of the Lord Jesus Christ. You'll find in Matthew presents the Lord Jesus Christ as King of Kings and Lord of Lords. That's why you find the genealogies in Matthew, because the genealogies, there are no records of the genealogies of the Lord Jesus Christ anywhere to be found today. None. We find out that after they, uh, 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 Titus of the Roman army came in in 70 AD. See, prior to that, you'll find out that the temple had all of the records of all the transactions that everything that took place under the Old Testament law. If a brother was sold into bondage, he couldn't pay his debts and so forth, another relative could come in and relieve him of that and so forth. The records gave the time, the date, and how you did it and everything else, and that was all recorded in there, just like every legal action is recorded in your courthouse today. But after that, you'll find out when they rejected and would not listen to God or anything else and there and when Christ came and then they rejected him he came unto his own but his own received him not then the Lord said all right time out Israel time out that's it here was your Messiah you crucified him you lifted him up with filthy dirty hands and so forth you could have crucified him with holy hands and said dear Lord you have to pay for our sins will be at the tomb when you're resurrected. But that wasn't the case. God said, all right, time out Israel. I'm not dealing with you as a nation anymore. I'm calling out the people for my name, which is neither Jew nor Gentile, and that is the church age you're in today. It was never known to the Old Testament prophets. But after that, in 70 AD, he said, all right, you rejected the Messiah. I'm going to scatter you to the four corners of the earth. In 70 A.D., the Roman uh, 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 Titus governor there, Titus, came in of the Roman army, and he sacked out Jerusalem. All of the records of all of the previous records were totally destroyed. There is none in existence today. The only records that we have for Jesus Christ to prove that he is the Messiah of the linkage of David, and he was truly God in human flesh, is the reason we have the two genealogies in the Bible today. Matthew presents him as a king. Every king has to have a linkage to show that he has a right to set upon the throne. Is that not right? Of course it is. That genealogy goes clear back to David because Christ is going to set upon the throne of David over in Jerusalem when he reigns in the millennium for a thousand years as king of kings and lord of lords you'll find out that the kingdom of heaven is mentioned over 30 some times in the book of Matthew only mentioned as 
the king or uh, the kingdom of heaven. That it always refers to, and it should read, the kingdom from heaven, because the king was here and would have set the millennial up had they accepted him as the Messiah. Now God knew that they wouldn't, but he came. They rejected him. So, the kingdom of heaven, when you find it in Matthew, always refers to the thousand year reign when Christ sets upon the throne clear at the end of time before he creates new heavens and new earth. Then you have Mark. Mark emphasizes not the kingship of Christ, but the servitude of Christ. And you'll find out, I believe it's out of 18 of the uh, chapters there, all begin with and, 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 showing a continuation of things. No genealogies in Mark because a servant, they don't care, nobody cares what the genealogy of a servant is. As long as he is willing to do the work that he's required to do, they don't need a genealogy. They just want to know if he's a good worker or not. So Mark presents the Lord Jesus Christ as the servant of Jehovah. Then we come on to Luke. Luke has the genealogies in it. And that goes clear back to Adam, not just clear back to David or so forth. Why does it go clear back to Adam? Because Jesus Christ took on a human flesh. Traces his genealogy clear back to Adam, showing that he was God in human flesh. But by the virgin birth, where not one drop of blood was projected or made, because Joseph, it takes the man, the woman, to provide the blood in the body. A woman does not have the facilities to do that by herself. So the Holy Spirit, therefore, did with the seed, and therefore provided the blood for the virgin birth. Therefore, Christ had no old nature, none whatsoever. So, that genealogy shows that he was perfect man. Then you come to the Gospel of John. John emphasizes the deity of Christ. In the beginning, John, chapter 1, In the beginning was the Word, the Word was with God, the Word was God. Jehovah's Witnesses put, the Word was a God, because they do not believe that Jesus Christ is God in human flesh. They have a work of salvation, if you didn't know that. They don't believe he was God in human flesh. If he wasn't God in human flesh, then Romans 3.23 says that all have sinned and come short of the glory of God, then if he's not God in human flesh, perfect, then he has to be a sinner just like you and I, and therefore he would have to pay for his own sin. All of that is garbage, but that's what religion does. <clears throat> John presents him as the Son of God. He was God in human flesh. In the beginning was the Word, the Word was with God, and the Word was God, because in verse 14 of the first chapter, the Word became flesh, right? Sure, he took on a human body, born of the virgin birth. There's an amazing thing in Matthew, Mark, and Luke. You'll find out in Matthew, you'll find out it gives there the temptation of the Lord Jesus Christ. Mark gives it in chapter 1. You find out that Luke gives it in chapter 3, I think it is, 3 or 4, he gives the temptation also. But in John, you'll not find the temptation of the Lord Jesus Christ. Why? Because as God, God cannot be tempted. God cannot be tempted, neither tempteth he any man, according to James chapter 1, neither tempteth he with any man, but every man is tempted when he is drawn away of his own lust and enticed. And when he is enticed, lust bringeth forth sin, and when sin brings its uh, fruit, it brings forth death. So, God cannot be tempted. Or you say, I thought Satan tempted him. Well, Satan thought he did. But he wasn't tempted. He was only tempted by Satan, but it was impossible because Christ with no old nature and being God, he couldn't sin if he wanted to. If he wanted to, he couldn't. It was an impossibility. So, God does not tempt any man, neither is he tempted. He cannot tempt any man. Every man is tempted when he's drawn away of his own lust. You know, so many times, you know, somebody will blame somebody else for tempting them to do something they shouldn't have done. It was their fault because they got tempted into it. But that's not it. Truthfully, when we're tempted, it's because we're drawn away of our own lust and we follow that temptation. Amen? Isn't that it? 
Like one man said, he said, you know, you see that blonde bombshell going down the line there. He said, when it talks in Matthew, it says, you know, if your eyes offend you, pluck it out. Well, don't give her a forwarding address, amen? That, that, that isn't going to work. We'd have to say our own lust sort of got the best of us, wouldn't we? You know. But anyway, that's Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. As we're going to see the genealogies, now there's a very important thing that's found clear back in Genesis here, and I'd like for you to go back there, Genesis chapter 49. Here's a prophecy clear back in the Old Testament here, in the book of Genesis here, and how this happened to fit all in here, we'll show you. It says here, in Genesis chapter 49, verse 10, it says, the septri, that is, the sign of a king, tribal identity, each tribe had their own identification. But the septri, the tribal identity, shall not depart from Judah. In other words, there was a tribe of Judah, a tribe of Simeon, and so forth. There was a tribe of uh, Reuben, and uh, there was a tribe of Issachar, Zebulon, Dan, Gad, Asher, Naphtali, Joseph. All these tribes, they all had their own identity. But since the prophecy was given that Christ should come out of the line of Judah, then you have to have, when Christ was born, you would have to have the credibility of all of the records still in the temple that could prove that Jesus Christ was the Messiah setting in the line of David so that he had a rightful heritage to set upon the throne. So, but if all the records were destroyed, there was no proof because when Titus came in in 70 AD and destroyed all of those records, there was absolutely no proof anywhere that could substantiate the fact that Jesus Christ was the Son of God, that he was of the tribe of Judah, he was of the linkage of David. None of that would be possible because there wasn't any records to prove it. That would be like going for uh, the deed of your house. If all the records are destroyed, there's no record of it anywhere, and you don't have a record, how are you going to prove it's your house? No, you just have to move into town and you bought it, really. Well, so forth. That doesn't hold a lot of weight because you probably have a receipt for what you paid for or your papers or so forth. But when you're challenging that Jesus Christ is a false Messiah, like the Jews did, well then, all of those records had to be intact when Jesus Christ was born, and until he died, they had to be there as proof that the Jews could go to the temple and prove this was your Messiah. So they had to be there. So, this prophecy clear back here, when it says, here, the sepulcher shall not depart from Judah, Judah, the tribal identity will not depart from Judah, nor a lawgiver from between his feet, until... Shiloh, which is, means the bringer of peace, that's Christ, until he come. And unto him shall the gathering of the people be. So, these records had to be intact in the temple when Christ came, and they were. Now, after that, and they rejected the Messiah, no need for the temple. God's going to put the record in Matthew, the genealogies that go clear back to David, and in Luke, Clear back to Adam, showing that Jesus Christ truly deity in Matthew and humanity in the Gospel of Luke was truly God in human flesh. This is the record that we have and how precious the Bible is that you have it. Now, let's go over here, if you will, and let's go to Matthew chapter 1, okay? Over here to Matthew chapter 1, okay? Now, when you first come here and you start, somebody says, well, just start the New Testament and just start reading it. So, the first thing you start to read is, where in the world does all of this rumbo-jumbo come from? You know, here we got so-and-so, we got so-and-so. I don't care who we got so-and-so, and so-and-so, we got so-and-so. Good night, I can't even pronounce the names. Let alone, why did God put all this stuff in here? It's very important why I put it in here. We look down here, and we find out that it shows... Like in verse 5, Salmon begot Boaz of Rachan, or Rachip, and which is the harlot in Joshua chapter 2, and showing that even the harlot can be saved. And her name is in the genealogies. Isn't that wonderful? 
That's one reason. But it's not the main reason. And then we find out about Tamar. She was guilty of whoredom in Genesis chapter 38. But her name here, she was saved. Her name is in the genealogies. But if you go on down, let's pick it up down here if you will. And let's just go on down because all of these are begotten, 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 begotten. So let's pick it up down to where the important part we want to get to. And the fact is that Joseph never begot Christ. Not biologically. He was not the biological father. Notice in verse 15, and Eliad begot Eleazar, Eleazar begot Mathen, Mathen begot Jacob, Jacob begot Joseph, the husband of Mary, of whom was born Jesus, who is called Christ. So, Joseph, Jacob begot Joseph, but Joseph never begot Christ, because he's not the biological father, you see. That's very, very important. Because if Joseph had begotten Jesus, then he would have been the biological father of Christ, he would have had an old nature, and he could have not been the sinless Christ. We find out that Pilate said, you know, I'm dealing with an innocent man. His wife said, Pilate, don't have anything to do with this just man. And there, in him was found no sin. You see, he never had any sin. He couldn't be tempted because he wasn't a sinner. He was perfect God and perfect man. Therefore, he could pay for our sins, couldn't he? Absolutely. That's where it has it, right here. Now, the paper that we've given out to you for you to study has more information and so forth and explains more. But I didn't want to go into that this morning because I have other things I want to cover. But at least you have it for your study files and so forth like that to where you could do a little bit more detailed study upon it. Now, let's go over to Luke. All right, here we go. Let's go to the Gospel of Luke here. We go over here to Luke. All right. And, see where we're at here, chapter 3, I believe. And you'll find out, in your information there, hold in Matthew, go back to Luke, and I, while we were here in Matthew, I wanted to point this out, and I'm sorry I had you turn first. Uh, back in Matthew chapter 1, the book of the generation of Jesus Christ, the son of David, the son of Abraham, that's as far back as it goes because it's only going to show he's of the linkage of the prophecy that Christ has to be born of the seed of David who was of the seed of Abraham of whom God promised all of the land of Palestine over there to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. All of that Christ will give to the Jews when he comes back to reign as King of Kings and Lord of Lords. Now, when he came the first time, we celebrate Christmas. He came as the lowly Jesus. He did not come. He showed his power. He healed the sick. He raised the dead. He showed every bit of power that nobody could do, only but God himself. But boy, oh boy, when he comes back the second time, we find out yet to go, and we'll just throw this in real fast here. The end of this church age is going to, end with the rapture when every Christian in a moment in the twinkling of an eye if it should come tonight you're gone I mean you're gone every Christian in the world is out of here right now you have a seven-year tribulation period and then at the end of that seven-year tribulation period it'll be so bad with the Antichrist so so bad that Christ said in Matthew except I shorten those days there'll be no flesh it'll be saved I mean, the Antichrist will seek to kill every Jew that he possibly can. He can't kill 144,000. They're protected by God. The two witnesses for the first three and a half years, they are allowed to die in the middle of the tribulation as a testimony to the people and so forth. But at the end of that seven-year tribulation period, after God shortens the time of that seven years, a few months, You'll find out Christ will come back. He'll judge the nations. He'll set up the kingdom. And he'll rule it for a thousand years. Now, when we come here, Luke, notice here, we'll just take the one verse here, in verse 23. And Jesus himself began to be about 30 years of age, being as was supposed, that is by 
He was supposed to be the son of Joseph by those that were denying the virgin birth. Now, how do you prove that? We'll go here in just a second. The son of Joseph, which was the son of Heli, which was the father of Mary and the father-in-law of Joseph. And we have that in your study there for you. But if you go to John, let's just go over here to chapter 8, verse 11. All right. Over here, chapter 8, verse uh, 41, I'm sorry. John chapter 8 here in verse 41. And why they said that he's supposed to be uh, the son of Joseph. In verse 41, you find out here in chapter 8, Christ dealing with these scribes and these Pharisees said, You do the deeds of your father. And then they said unto him, We be not born of fornication. We have one father, even God. And speaking about the Lord Jesus Christ, that he was an illegitimate child of Mary, and Joseph, you see. And that's what they kept saying. Jesus saith unto him, If God were your father, you would love me, for I proceeded forth, came from God, and neither came I of myself, but he sent me. And why don't you understand my speech? You can't hear my word. You are of your father the devil, and the lust of your father you will do. He was a murderer in the beginning. He abode not in the truth, because he has no truth in him. And when he speaketh a lie, he speaketh of his own, for he is a liar and the father of it. But if you go back here, here, in verse 42, is a very interesting thing, and it will give you an answer to some things too. Jesus said unto them, If God were your father, you would love me. And just mark this down. It's a good verse to use when somebody says, Oh, I believe in God, but I don't believe in Jesus. No, you're a liar, sir. You're just exactly like Satan. Because if you believe God, you would trust Christ as your Savior if you believe God. Because Christ said, No man comes unto the Father but by me. God gave His only begotten Son that whosoever believeth in Him. So if you say, Oh, I worship God. I know there's a God, but I, I, I don't believe... Uh, I believe we have to do the best we can to get to heaven. And, uh, but you don't believe in the God of the Bible. You believe in some makeup God you've made up. But you don't believe in the God of the Bible because if you believed in the God of the Bible and the God of creation and the God that created mankind to love Him and to serve Him, you would believe in God that gave His only begotten Son, would you not? So if you believe and you go to church every Sunday and everything else, oh, I believe in God... Have you trusted Christ as your Savior? Do you know that you're going to heaven when you die? If you don't, you're not trusting the God of the Bible. Because if you did, then you would trust what God said to trust. And I gave my only begotten Son that whosoever believeth in Him would never perish but have eternal life. First John wrote it also. He said, 1 John 5, 13, These things have I written unto you that believe on the name of the Son of God that you may know that you have eternal life. So all these people that run around and say, Oh, I believe in God. You are a two-faced liar, sir. Now, I don't think you're going to win them to the Lord if you call them to their face a two-faced liar, but you have to use a little bit more tact than that when you're dealing with them. Whatever God you're looking at is not the God of the Bible. Because Christ said, If God were your Father, you would love me. But you don't love Him enough to even believe that He died on that cross to pay for your sins. You don't love Him. You just think He's a good man. You don't think He was God in human flesh. If he was a good man, he'd have to be a sinner because all of sinning comes short of the glory of God. You see how, with knowing a little bit about the Bible, how you can put the rest, these bunch of God deniers, false claimers of a self-righteousness, and oh, we believe in God, now leave us alone, and no bothers, we believe in God too. Yes, we do. No, you're a liar, sir, you don't believe in God. You see, okay. So we wanted to bring that out a little bit. That's why you have the two genealogies, and we give that little line you know, down through there for you, uh, so you could follow the genealogies of Matthew, the genealogies of uh, Mary, down through there. In other words, there was a curse that was placed upon the line of coming down through one of David's sons. Now, I don't think we'll have time to get into that this morning. We'll probably go over that maybe next week, but Let's go on to a couple of other things also if we can, all right? We find out that the virgin birth was prophesied in the book of Isaiah, chapter 7. So let's go back to Isaiah here in chapter 7, all right? Isaiah, chapter 7. Okay. Now this is sort of interesting. 
because we find out back here in Isaiah here in chapter 7, we find out that Ahaz, who happened to be the king here of Judah, and he was a very evil man, and anyway, uh, God has sent Isaiah here to him and uh, said, I want you to prophesy because I'm going to destroy this man. I'm going to destroy the, the uh, kingdom there. And, uh, but I want you to tell him. And uh, anyway, we find out that there were two nations that were coming against the nation of Judah. And uh, they were called two firebrands. But they were coming down to invade Judah. And God had told <laughs> Isaiah to tell Ahaz, the king of Judah, don't worry about a thing, I'll take care of them. You don't have to worry about it. They're not going to uh, capture you. I will protect you. Just like he did with Assyria when he killed 185,000 in one day. Uh, but God can do that. But anyway, God has said to Ahaz and told Isaiah, you tell Ahaz, I make this promise to him, that these two foreign nations cannot and will not capture Judah. Now, he said, uh, you can tell Ahaz, ask me of any sign that you want, whether it be from heaven or whether it be on earth, ask me any sign that you want and I'll give it to you. I'll give you a supernatural sign and if I can do that, I can take care of your enemies. And Ahaz, in his self-righteousness, he was depending on other allegiance in order to help him and so forth instead of the Lord that angered the Lord so he said to Isaiah then I'll give you a sign anyway that was a sign of the virgin birth of Christ in Isaiah chapter 7 and verse 14 but let's go through that a little bit so you can see why and where this sign came from of the prophecy of the Lord Jesus Christ if you go here in well let's see here we go here this is uh, Let's go in chapter 7 in verse 3. Okay, let's take that. Chapter 7, verse 3. We find out here, Then said the Lord unto Isaiah, Go forth now to meet Ahaz thou, and Shear, and Jeshub, and the sun at the end of the conduit of the upper pool in the highway of the fuller's field. So, he said this here in chapter 3, Speak to Ahaz, who was out in the field, inspecting his defenses to protect Jerusalem from Ephraim and Syria, the northern kingdom of Israel. Now let's go to 5 and 6. The two nations had made an alliance to fight against Judah, the southern kingdom that we had just spoken about. So let's go to verse 5 and 6, okay? Here we go. Because Syria, Ephraim, and the son, and the son of Remaliah, have taken evil counsel against thee, saying, Let us go up against Judah and vex it, and let us make a breach therein for us, and to set the king, set a king in the midst of it, even the son of Tabeel. Thus saith the Lord God, It shall not stand, neither shall it come to pass. God said, No, they can come, but I'll stop them. You see. So, that's very interesting there. Those two firebrands and so forth, we come on down, and the reason he said that, if you go to verse 8, God said, don't you trust in anybody else, because if you're trusted in Ephraim and so forth, I'm going to destroy it in 65 years. It's not going to be there. So let's go down to verse 8. For the head of Syria is Damascus, the capital, and the head of Damascus is Rezan, that's the leader, and within three score, score is 20, that's 60, in five years shall Ephraim be broken, that it... Be not a people. So don't be trusted in uh, another nation to help you and to save you. Trust in the Lord. The Lord said, you're not going to be captured. Listen to what I'm telling you. Isn't it better in the middle verse of the Bible, put your trust in the Lord, the confidence in men? You ever been let down by somebody that you trust in your life? Well, probably a little one way or another that uh, you may have been a little disappointed. But... When you want to see things happen, trust in the Lord. He makes them happen. He owns a cattle on a thousand hills. I know when uh, we were the first came to Walnut Grove, we were running out of money. I'm telling you after some things. And uh, I told the Lord, I said, you don't need all them cows up here. Kill one of them. Do send it to market. You know, send the money down here. You know, and it's fun to joke with the Lord because he always does it. 
we have a, uh, and it's just amazing, we have a man down in, uh, ne never knew him before, and uh, been on our internet and so forth, sharp as a tack. He's a chiropractor down in Missouri, and uh, just, just a peach of a fellow, a peach of a wife, and so forth. And uh, believe it or not, we uh, here a while back had sent a check up for $300, these ties. And uh, yesterday, when we got his ties again, it was $500, and I don't usually do that, I'm going to give you his name. And because the only way, I don't know what anybody really gives at all, except if uh, somebody designates it to here or there, then I know that. And, but other than that, I have no idea, and I don't want to know in that. But uh, anyway, here's somebody just by the Word of God that he loves, his wife loves, and he is one sharp man. And uh, we converse back and forth every, uh, a lot of the time, I'll just say that. And, uh, but it's just uh, refreshing to see how he's witnessing to the Amish. And uh, uh, he was telling me how they don't believe that Jesus Christ is God and so forth and that. We had the Amish down there south of us when we were pastoring down in uh, Ohio. We had the Amish down there. And I remember one Sunday afternoon I went down there and they had a big, uh, uh, I should uh, plant down there, they produce cheese and so forth. But uh, I heard that they, somebody had a bear trap for sale down there. So down I went to you know, see if I could get it. But I found out a lot about them and so forth there. But uh, anyway, he's a very sharp man, and uh, it's just wonderful because, boy, does that ever help. That sure helps, doesn't it, from somebody I've never met personally. But isn't that what the Word of God does when you love the Word of God? Uh, nobody ever, we have no gimmicks for getting money. None. We, we, we're, we have none. We don't plead for it on the radio. We don't plead for it in church. Because if Christians don't want to give, and when they give, the thing that God honors very simply is you give because you love the Lord, you're learning the Word, and you want to. It's out of your heart. It's not because of some guilty, well, our church is going to fold if I don't give something. That's the wrong attitude at all. Then if the church is going to fold because of, if you don't give, then they need to quit spending what they're spending, right? <laughs> That's the same way you do. You're going to go... And file for bankruptcy, I guess, if you don't quit spending what you don't have to spend, right? And you're borrowing what you're spending and don't have enough money to pay it back. You should wait before you get it and you wouldn't have to borrow it. And then you could buy it and pay for it, right? We got through that again. That sounds pretty good, doesn't it? Okay. Okay. Well, let's go on down here and see this and you'll see that. Now, you'll find out here, uh, in about 65 years, Ephraim will be nothing. So don't depend on Ephraim. To prove it, Ahaz could ask for a sign of the Lord. Notice in chapter 7, verse 11 and 12. Ask thee a sign of the Lord thy God. Ask it either in the depth or in the height above. In other words, ask it anything you want to ask, whether it be something from heaven, something under the earth, on the earth, whatever. Just ask and I'll give it to you, the Lord said. Be something supernatural, miracle that nobody could provide. You just ask it and I'll give it to you. And if I give it to you, it's proof to you that I will not let you be destroyed. Okay. So, we come on down. Verse 11, Moreover, the Lord spake unto Ahaz, saying, As he has signed, and so forth, they have said, I will not ask, neither will I tempt the Lord. It was a hypocritical refusing. Just a big old hypocritical answer. He responded with scorn. He was not interested in any sign from the Lord. He wanted to get on with the important... Uh, the important defense work did not want to be bothered by the prophet. However, God intervened. Isaiah replied, Ahaz, you'll get a sign even though you don't want it. Notice here in verse 14. Therefore the Lord himself shall give you a sign. Behold, a virgin shall conceive and bear a son and shall call his name Emmanuel. And on. There's where we get the prophecy clear on into the future there of the virgin birth of the Lord Jesus Christ. But it all consummated here from the fact of talking to Ahaz, who he was going to destroy, because Ahab would trust a man and not trust the Lord, and so forth. So, God just went ahead and give a sign here. Ahaz had no idea, didn't want to be bothered, didn't want to listen to the prophet. God said, I would protect you, you don't want anything to do with it. No, I'm going to Ephraim, he'll take care of me, and so forth like that and come to find out in 65 years there was no Ephraim. So they were taken captive. 
pretty good lesson, isn't it? Better put your trust in the Lord and confidence in men. Amen. Aren't you glad you're on the Lord's side? Really? Aren't you really glad of that? That you're not just living your life, I just wonder about this, is this going to happen? Who can I trust? Who can I not trust one day or another? That you have the Lord to take any problem, come boldly before the throne of grace, that you might receive help in time of need in there. And I see our time's gone. So we're going to stop here with this. And then we're going to get into Mary and the children and the fact of Isaiah 9, 6 and how precise the Word of God is when speaking about giving the birth of the Lord Jesus and so forth. So, in closing, let me just illustrate this as we do each time. If you're watching or you're listening and you don't know for sure you're going to heaven when you die, there's a good chance you're not. Because if you were, you would know it. And you would have that confidence and you would have that security of knowing Jesus Christ is my Savior. I've trusted Him. I know that He paid for my sins. I will never perish to have eternal life. And if you can't say that, you're lost on your way to hell. Because, you see, you're believing something. Either you're good enough or somebody's give you some false information, but you never got it from the Bible. Because God says, For by grace are you saved through faith. That not of yourselves, it's a gift of God, not of works. At least any man should boast. So, let me illustrate it real fast. The willful sin, I'm the sinner. I represent every human being ever born on the face of the earth. Because we've all sinned, come short of the glory of God. If I refuse to accept God's payment for my sin, there's only one choice left. I must pay for that sin myself in the lake of fire, in a place called hell, and I'll be there for all time and eternity. I'll never get out, and God, I will hear him say to me, or Jesus Christ, when I stand before him, depart from me, you are cursed into this everlasting fire before the devil and his angels. His angels will take you and cast you into the lake of fire. If you're living during the tribulation, you miss the rapture of that. But that's one thing that will happen. But, if you trust Christ, you don't have to go to hell and pay for your sin. This hand would represent Christ no sin. And what happens is, Dear Lord, I believe you died on that cross for me. I have no reservations. Thank you for paying for my sin. At the moment you believe that, your sin is transferred and Mark paid at the cross of Jesus Christ. Then, since you are a sinner and I'm still a sinner, God says, you've got to be absolutely perfect to go to heaven, so you can never be that because you've already sinned. If you never sinned anymore, you're not perfect because you've already sinned. But I'll give you my righteousness. I'll put it to your account. Here, here's the ticket to heaven. My shed blood. Your name is already in the Lamb's Book of Life, but if you die without Christ, it'll be blotted out. Now it's going to be sealed with the blood of Christ, just like you put a piece of scotch tape over your name, you can't erase it with an eraser. It can't be taken out. And when that blood is on there, you have the righteousness. Dear God, here's my righteousness I gave to Max Jones. He didn't deserve it, but he accepted and he believed that I died for him. He is now my child, and he is ours forever. And he will never perish but have eternal life. And I thank God that he loved a sinner like me. If you've never trusted Christ, I hope that you'll do it. And uh, we just bow in a word of prayer when we do. You can just tell the Lord that, dear Lord, I thought there was more to it than that. Well, whoever gave you that idea lied to you because you're saved as a free gift, bought and paid for, and you couldn't do anything to get it except, accept, A-C-C-E-P-T, accept what Christ did for you. So let's just bow in a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you so much. Thank you for each one here today, and we thank you, dear Lord, for those that are watching, that uh, if they've never trusted Jesus Christ, that uh, it's their life. Nobody can do it for them. We can only relate to you what God said in the Bible. I didn't make it up. I just read John 3.16. God loved the world as everybody in it, gave his only begotten son, went to the cross, paid for the sins of the whole world, and each individual has a decision to make. If they accept Christ, put their faith in him, believing that he died on that cross to pay for their sin, they will never perish but have everlasting life. We thank you for that. Ask your blessings on each and every one in Jesus' precious name. Amen.